We're glad that he was there today. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd invite you to turn to Judges. Uh, Judges chapter 3, right uh, towards the beginning of the Old Testament. And uh, we've been going through uh, this uh, series on extraordinary people. And uh, we've tried to go in roughly chronological order as we've uh, gone through here. But really, uh, for the summer, we don't have an overriding theme as far as one message building on the other. But rather, we're just looking at different people in the Old Testament. Ordinary people who God used in extraordinary ways. And the thing that I want to be encouraging to you about is, that is the same God that we serve. Now, God may not use you in the same way. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say that our story this morning, God will not use you in exactly the same way as he used the man we're going to look at this morning. But God does want to use you. And he, he desires to do great things in us and through us. And so in Judges chapter 3, we talked about Caleb last week when the, the nation of Israel, of course, uh, God used Abraham to form this nation. They went down uh, through Joseph and the famine into Egypt. They became slaves. They came out of slavery. Uh, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they've gone in now and they've taken the promised land. And they are dwelling in the promised land. They are a nation of uh, tribes, and, and uh, they've got some leadership structure, but there's not this overarching government. Uh, there's not a king. Uh, there's, there, at this time, God would raise up judges, uh, people who would come and, and be great leaders for the time of, that the country needed. But what you see happening is a pattern that would develop where God would raise up a leader and, and the people would follow God and they would follow this leader. But oftentimes after the leader was gone, the people would fall back into idolatry. They would fall back into uh, a coziness, if you will, with their neighbors. Uh, these, these people that didn't worship Jehovah God. They would turn to wickedness and to evil. And there would be judgment that would come upon them. That's exactly what happens in Judges chapter 3 and verse number 12, where it says, Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted Ammonites and Amalekites as allies. And then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. Now think about that for a moment. Jericho was really a symbol of God's mighty work for the nation of Israel. That was the first place where they crossed the Jordan River, the walls fell down under the leadership of Joshua, and God gave them a great victory. And now that city is occupied by this Moabite king. And then in verse 14 it says, The Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. And so they are a people who are occupied. Matter of fact, what we're going to see in this story is they would have to give great payments of taxes to this king. And so you can imagine how that would feel. You know, we pay taxes here in America. God bless America, amen? I mean, here we're celebrating our country's independence and I bring up taxes. And oftentimes, paying your taxes can be frustrating. Maybe you don't experience that, but occasionally I look at our government and the things they spend money on, and I think, that's my money. Going for that. But at least it's my government. I get a vote, right? Whatever good that does, but I do get a vote. And there are some things that my money goes to that I appreciate. Schools, roads. I, I like to drive on roads, and I prefer them without potholes. I don't enjoy road construction, but I do enjoy constructed roads. You with me? The Israelites are paying. Some of you are like, no, we hate taxes and road construction. We'll talk about you next week. But here they're giving all this money. They're having to sacrifice and suffer, and it goes to a foreign king, a foreign country, a foreign government. They're not seeing benefit from that. 
They could come in. They could make laws as they wanted. They weren't being ruled by their own people. They were an occupied people. And it happened because the Israelites had fallen back into their, their idolatrous ways. In Judges chapter 3, in verse 7 and 8, it talks about this in a little more detail. It says, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord their God. They served the images of Baal and the Asherah poles, which was another uh, idol, basically, that they, would, that they would worship at. Then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King uh, Kushan uh, Rishathaim, uh, and he talks about uh, that they were serving him for, 18, for eight years. God raised up a judge. They were free. They enjoyed, uh, they enjoyed uh, not being under that occupation. But then now, here we find them turning back to these other gods, turning away from God, and God judges them with this king, Eglon. They had forgotten the lessons from previous generations. You know, I, I read some that said that those who uh, don't know history are destined to repeat it. And those who don't, do know history are destined to sit by and watch people repeat it. Um, but uh, it's true that we need to learn lessons, not just that we learn, but from others. Have you ever thought about that? Like, think with me for a moment about hard lessons in your life that you've learned. See, when I think that, there immediately come several things in my mind of really colossally stupid things that I've done and endured the consequences for that. I could make a top 10 list or top 100 list. But if we have some wisdom, we don't just learn the lessons we learn, we can learn the lessons that other people learn. We can look at generations before us. We can look at other people in our lives, and we can say, you know, I see the mistake that they've made. I see the lesson that they've learned. I think I'll just take that lesson to heart and not have to make that same mistake. That's really what wisdom is, right? We can learn from other people, but we certainly need to learn from the past generations. That's true in the church. You see the church as a whole make mistakes and make mistakes over and over. Because we're people and that's what we tend to do. But here the nation of Israel did not learn from the previous generations. Psalm 34 and verse 11 says, Come my children and listen to me and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Listen, I don't know what you, uh, your home life was like when you grew up. Maybe you had godly parents and, and they... Uh, they were able to instill godly principles in your life. Maybe that wasn't your background. But I believe as Christians, we should strive to make that our next generation. I want my children to love God and walk with Him more than I do. I want them to increase in their faith. I want to see, I, I, my desire is if the Lord doesn't come back, to have grandchildren and great-grandchildren that walk with God and that God would give me a godly heritage in my children's children. Now, I can't control that. I, I, I'm, as a grandfather, I may or may not have much influence on my grandkids. And if I, if I live to see my great-grandkids, they'll probably look at me like I looked at my great-grandparents, which were, wow, those people are old. But what I can do is try to pass on a godly heritage to my children and instill in them the need to pass that on to their kids. And as Christians, even if we didn't grow up in a godly home, we can look at previous generations and seek to not make those same mistakes. But that's not what the children of Israel did. They forgot the lessons of previous generations, and they began to become comfortable again with the world. One of the things that I believe God is giving to Christians in America is the great opportunity to be distinct from the world. Because our country, and, and I don't want to be negative this morning, really, this is a message of, of hope 
and optimism today, but I can tell you that I do believe as Christians in America, we are going to get the opportunity to stand up and be separate from our world, from our society. We need, to, we need to be prepared for that. We need to pray for that. Romans chapter 12 and verse two, number 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I love this verse because it, what it says is that God doesn't just work in our heart and forgive us of our sin, and give us eternal life. He does do that. But God desires to transform us, and it happens in the very way that we think. Because you know what? All of us have patterns in our, in our head, thought patterns, that are harmful to us. Now, some of them more than others. But you see people, it's easy, I think it's easier to see this a lot of times in other people. You you look at somebody else and go, that person makes the same mistake over and over and over again. Maybe they're a person who doesn't pick a, 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 a partner in relationships very well. They just have a tendency not to do that. And you say, well, that person makes the same mistakes. Or they, they, with their finances, maybe they make the same mistakes over and over again, or whatever it is. And the truth is, it's, it's in all of our lives. And you think, well, it's the way I am, and I can't help myself, but God desires to change the way that we think. What a tremendous thing. And he, and he doesn't just say change, he says transform transform, to take something that is one thing and transform it into something else. To take somebody who doesn't make the right decisions and has self-destructive behavior, to be somebody who can be wise and who can make choices that better our lives. That's what God desires to do with us. But part of it begins with separation from the world. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Do not love the world, this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. I was thinking about that this week. I was out in my yard, and my wife and I bought a house last April, a a year ago April, and and the backyard was a wreck. And I'd say we've worked really hard, but really we've hired people who've worked really hard. And we've done a big transformation in our yard. Then a couple weeks ago, I mowed the grass, and it like shocked the grass we put in, and it all turned brown. I know. (laughs) That's what my wife said. I was like, it'll probably be all right. Um, So we've been watering it, and I was out there looking at it. And I was out there looking at the grass this week. And I was thinking about the message last week about Caleb, about how he had gone into the land, and 10 other guys looked at it and said, we can't take it. But Caleb looked at it and said, God's going to give this to us. And I thought about the heavenly perspective that we ought to have as Christians. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't care for the things on the earth. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be good stewards of what God's entrusted to us. I want to have a nice green lawn, but in the end, I'm going to be, my body's going to be under a lawn. It's life. None of us get out of it alive, right? Right? And the Bible tells me that my time here on earth is a vapor that appears for a second and then is gone, and it's nothing compared to eternity. So while it's okay that I can spend time on my yard, I need to understand it's not the end all. And if the Lord doesn't come back, all that work that I do on that house, somebody else is just going to enjoy. It's true. Because someday I'm going to die. And I don't know when that's going to be. And I'm not, that's not a depressing thing. Listen, as a Christian, that's an exciting thing. 
That's an exciting thing. Because I, I was also reading this week in, at the beginning of Genesis, and you realize what the world was like before the fall? One of the curses of the fall was the ground. And, and, and God said to Adam, now you're going to have to work the ground by the sweat of your brow to get anything to grow. Previous to that, no weeds, no thistles, no watering, just good fruit and plants and trees grew. I can't even wrap my brain around that. Can you imagine planting a garden and then going, I'll just wait now. No weeding, no watering. I'm just going to get fruit. I'm just going to get vegetables. I'm just going to get the crops. How great would that be? No squirrels to come eat your strawberries. No whatever. It was perfect. Or if the squirrels ate your strawberries, there'd be enough strawberries for everybody. I, I don't even know if there are squirrels in heaven. But anyway... That's what we have to look forward to. But the Israelites lost their perspective. They cozied up to the world. They began to serve other gods. And God judged them through this king, Eglon. They had to pay taxes to him. Notice that God used an alliance of nations to accomplish his will. Listen, I think one of the most encouraging verses in all of Scripture it's found in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. Listen to what it says. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. See, God used a wicked king from a wicked nation to bring judgment upon his people. But it was part of God's plan. Now, as a Christian here in America... I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved in politics. I think that's fine. I think we ought to work and, and try to get Canada to who have values that are, that are in line with our values. And we ought to seek to get those people elected. But can I tell you, I'm not fearful of our leaders because their very heart is directed by God. Listen, I don't always like all of the things that our governmental leaders do. But God's not, God's in control. God's the one I serve. He's the one who, who is running everything around us. Not, not Obama or the Democrats or the Republicans or, or whomever. Listen, I don't have to be fearful of those things. You realize, I mean, people in Washington, D.C., they can raise and lower my taxes, and that's important. But God spins this very universe in the direction he desires it. That's the difference in power between the king of kings and the president or congress or whomever. And I love that verse. And God uses this alliance of nations. And we see in Hosea chapter 8 that sowing and reaping applies to individuals, but it also applies to nations. Hosea 8, 7 says they, talking about uh, this country planted, not our country, but the nation of Israel. They have planted the wind and will harvest the whirlwind. The stocks of grain wither and produce nothing to eat. And even if there is any grain, foreigners will eat it. Listen, we reap what we sow. That's true as individuals, but it's true as a people. And so we need to, we need to seek, and it begins as individuals to seek God, to repent before him and to turn back to him. And that's what the nation of Israel did here in Judges chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. I love the story of Ehud. One of the reasons is because he's left-handed. And I'm left-handed. Great and mighty warriors. Not. But it's true. He's a left-handed guy. God used him. But notice that the people cried out to God. 
God answers those who humbly call on him. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 6 says, In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. And listen to this last sentence. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Jesus Christ sits and waits for us to call out. And he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, taking our case to God Almighty. That's the vision that that God gives to us in his word. He is waiting for those who will call out to him, who will cry out to God. And when the nation of Israel turned to God and they cried out to him, he delivered them. And can I tell you that whether it's you as an individual, whether it's your need for salvation, whether it's your need for relief in some situation, whether it's as a church or even as a country, if we will turn and humbly cry out to God, He will answer us. Not that He will take all of our problems away, but He is a God who desires to make Himself known in our lives, to make Himself, to show Himself mighty if we'll only humbly cry out to him. I think a lot of times what's missing is that humility. All throughout scripture, when you see God move, it is humbly going to God. It is going to God with repentance. Not going to God with, well, listen, God, let me tell you what I need. I, God, is, God is our father. And I, I, I believe in this one area, maybe, God reacts a little bit like I do as a father. Listen, especially, I have a son, and I love him. And he's here this morning, and I want him to know that. But I have two daughters, and they are beautiful. And I know if my son really, really wants something, he goes to his mom. It's true. It's true. He's got her wrapped around his finger. But if my daughters want something, come right to daddy. Listen, I mean, there's nothing. And and sometimes my daughter, my little daughter, Kinsey, she'll just come to me and go, daddy, and give me that smile. And I think, you evil girl, you know exactly what you're doing. And then I go, what do you want? But if my kids tell me what they need, I don't react very well to that. I should be honest. Hey, Dad, you know what I need you to buy me? Yeah, nothing. That's what you need me to buy you. My kids come, though, and they say, hey, Dad, you know, I really need this, or I really would like this. Could you help me out with this? I always want to do that. But the attitude has a big effect. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? The same with our Heavenly Father. We come to Him and say, well, listen, God, what you owe me is, listen, we don't want God to give us what He he owes us. I don't want justice from God. I love grace. We need to humbly and in repentance go to him. And so the Lord delivered the nation of Israel. Now I do want to put in a disclaimer this morning. I I do not believe God is calling any of us to assassination, which is what Ehud did. I'm I'm not advocating that today. What I want us to learn is how God can use us to accomplish his will. In Judges 3 and verse 16, verse 15, it says that uh, they, the Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglah. Apparently Ehud was a, was a trustworthy guy. He was, he was given the gold or the silver to bring the tax money to Eglah. So Ehud, in verse 16, made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long. And he strapped it to his right leg, keeping it hidden under his clothes. 
And historians tell us that oftentimes in, in frisking people coming into the king, they would just pat down their left leg. Because most people are right-handed, and if they had a sword or a dagger, they would draw it from their left leg. And so they could just kind of pat them down, see that they weren't a threat to the king. But Ehud was left-handed. And he put that dagger, he strapped it to his right leg. He hid it under his clothes. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. Not really relevant to the story, but I enjoy the detail. <laughs> After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near, near Gilgal, he turned back, he came to Eglon, and he said, I've got a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet, and he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room, and Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. Now, I think of King Eglon as this fat guy who's hot. And I know it's a little warm in here this morning. Several of you are fanning. I'm not accusing you of being overweight, okay? It, it is warm this morning. I'll tell you what happened. Um, I came in this morning. We turned on the coolers last night like we do every Saturday. Came in this morning. Everything was good. I was messing around, and I came back in about 7.45 or 8, and I'm like, what's that smell? And somewhere outside, a skunk had sprayed. I know. And it wasn't real close, but ever how the wind was going, I could smell a skunk outside. Now, 15, 20 minutes later, you couldn't smell the skunk outside. But it didn't quite work that way in here. So I opened doors, and we set up a big fan, and we tried to get all the air out, and I walked around with spray good smells, good stuff, and uh, hopefully you didn't notice it. Now you're like, I do smell a skunk now that he mentioned that. <laughs> now all you can think of is, it smells horrible. But we, for the most part, got the stench out, but in that process of getting the smelly air out, it was also the cool air. And the warm air came in a little bit, so it's not as cool in here as I would have liked. But I picture in my mind this King Egon in this room that's kind of cool. Maybe it had, was kind of open air. He's this big fat king getting fat off the tax money of the Israelites. And Ehud comes in and he says, hey, I've got a, I've got a secret message for you from God. And as King Egon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. Not relevant to this story, but neat visual, right? Ehud's like, ooh. It was a nice dagger, but I'm never going to see that again. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the king's bowels emptied again. Then Ehud closed and locked the door of the room and escaped down the, the latrine. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room, so they waited. But when the king didn't come out, after a long delay, they became concerned. They got a key. When they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. While the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Sirai. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded a call to arms. Then he led a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him, and the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. God brought a great victory through this man Ehud. A couple of lessons I want us to learn. 
It's interesting, the tribe of Benjamin, which Ehud was from, was known for having left-handed warriors. Judges 20 talks about that they had 700 men who would, were great with slings. Very accurate, and they were left-handed. In First Chronicles, it talks about warriors from the tribe of Benjamin that could fight with either hand. But God used the uniqueness of Ehud, not totally unique. It's not that uncommon to be left-handed. Statistics say about 10 to 12% of people are left-handed. But God used that uniqueness of him to be able to sneak a dagger in to the king's presence. And God uses the unique characteristics of each and every one of us to accomplish his will. Even our weaknesses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse number 26, it says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. He chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Listen, I'm not telling you this morning that there aren't people here that are smart, that are strong, that are wise. But God says even our weaknesses he uses so that the glory doesn't come to us, but to him. Listen, as a, as a preacher, I want to present God's word in as eloquent a way as I can. I want to try to preach with, with power, and, and I want to try to challenge you intellectually, and, and I want to try to relate to you emotionally. But ultimately, the best thing that I can do as a preacher is give you God's word. Because it is powerful and sharp and strong, and it can do what my gifts of rhetoric, as limited as they are, could never do. So I don't want to just preach and have you feel better. I'm not even sure I could accomplish that. I don't want to entertain you with some humor. I might be able to, the smarter ones of you, get that far. That's a joke, see? Some of you are like, not funny. I just want to give you God's word. Because God's word changes lives. My preaching can. The same thing is true in every area when, we, when it relates to God. Listen, you say, God can't use me. I'm not, I'm not mighty. I'm not strong. I'm not smart. I'm not rich. That's who God's looking for. That's who God's looking for. To show himself mighty. To show himself wise. To show himself strong. To show himself rich. So that he might get the glory. Not us. It wasn't that Ehud was some great warrior. It was that he was a guy who God decided he could use. And he used just the fact that he was left-handed and had the ability to make a knife. That was it. And God used it to conquer, to, to conquer Moab. And then finally, I want to leave you with this this morning. Ehud had the courage to be used by God. Not an easy thing. Not an easy thing to kill a king, but not an easy thing to say, I really believe this is God's will. And I believe God is going to use this to accomplish a great victory. Not only did he kill the king, but he went and he rallied his countrymen and said, God's given us a great victory. At that point, that was just a statement of faith, was it not? But he had the courage 
to be used by God. See, over and over in God's Word, He tells us that the most important characteristic of a servant of His is just the ability, just the willingness to be used. It's faithfulness. It's a desire to be used by God. It's not talent. It's not great intellect. It's a willingness to be used. But sometimes that takes a lot of courage. What if God doesn't come through in the way I think he would? What if, what if I fail? How will that reflect on God? Or what if God isn't really going to do exactly what he said he would do? It takes faith and it takes courage to be used by God. For God has not given us, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 says, a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Listen, Paul wrote those words to Timothy, his protege in the faith, a young man who was, who was sent to, to be a pastor and to be a leader. And, and, and I can imagine that Timothy thought, you know, it was okay when I was the assistant. But now that I'm here trying to pastor these people, what am I doing? I've had those thoughts. I told somebody a few weeks ago, you know, for a long time I was a youth pastor. I worked with teenagers and I worked in the church and I would preach and I would do different things, but I was always a staff guy. And that's an important position. And we've got staff guys here at Belmar and I thank God for them. The work that they do and, and, and just the ministry wouldn't go without them. But when I was a staff guy, I could always blame the head guy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, if it wasn't for, for dumb decisions and, and just nearsighted on his part, I mean, we could really be doing something great. And then God called me to Belmar to be the pastor, and I'm like, man, now I can blame nobody. I mean, it can't be God's fault. He's Almighty God. Some pastors, they like to blame their people. You go to, you go to pastor's meetings, and, and past, some pastors sit around and go, man, these people that I got, they're just hard-headed, and, you know. But I realized, really, who's coming to your church? People like you, probably. I mean, there's really nobody to blame but me. And that's not to say that the church is dependent upon me. It's not. But it takes courage sometimes to follow God. It takes courage to step out and do what he's calling us to do. The Bible says that we walk by faith, but I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you with this man Ehud. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about him except for this short passage. Didn't seem to be all that outstanding. He was apparently enough of a leader and trustworthy enough that he was in charge of taking the taxes. But he was a guy who had the courage to follow God. And I would challenge you this morning, what is God calling you to do that you haven't had the courage to do? Maybe it's to be a better leader to your children or in your home. Maybe it's God is challenging you in the area of giving. Maybe God's challenging you in the area of service. Maybe God's challenging you to take a stand for some things in your life and, and get rid of some things and, and establish uh, maybe some better habits. I don't know what it is. But do you have the courage and the faith to step out and do what God is calling you to do. Can I challenge you that God will always meet our faith? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's not going to see us take a step of faith only to fall and crash and burn. That may not always end exactly the way you think it will. But can I tell you, God is always faithful. 
So I put a next step there on the back of your bulletin, and it's also there on your connection card. It just says pray and ask God to give you the courage and the faith to be used by him. I would challenge you to follow the example of Ehud, not in the area of assassination, but in the area of service to God. The courage, the faith to do what God is calling you to do. Let's pray this morning.